Okay, so in this video, we're going to look at the 2017 IGCSE paper four, the longer answer paper. So we're going to start off with a speed time graph for an ice skater. So we've got them going at constant speed of 11 meters per second for the first three seconds. And then their speed is decreasing up until uh, 12 seconds. Uh, okay, so that's what we've generally speaking got. So what is meant by deceleration, uh, it means that the rate of it means the rate of decrease of speed. So it tells you that the speed of the object is decreasing over a period of time. Uh, just to quickly flag this up, deceleration is not the same as negative acceleration. Uh, the negative sign in acceleration tells you the direction of the acceleration. It doesn't actually tell you whether speed is increasing or decreasing. Okay, so use the diagram to determine the distance traveled between times uh, three seconds and six seconds. So distance traveled is the area under the graph. So between three seconds and six seconds, you want this area here, which is a trapezium. So we're going to do the average of the sides times by the base, giving us 24 meters. Find the deceleration between those two. So average acceleration is given by this equation here. Uh, so we do final speed minus the initial speed divided by the time taken, that gives us minus two. So the deceleration is two meters per second squared. We get rid of the negative sign. State what happens to the size of the deceleration after time six seconds. Well, the gradient of the graph is decreasing, so the deceleration is decreasing as well, because deceleration is the gradient of the graph. State what, is meant, what happens to the resultant force on the skater after six seconds. Well, whatever happens to deceleration tells you what happens to resultant force. They always do the same thing. So if deceleration decreases, the resultant force decreases. That's what Newton's second law tells us. So a footballer kicks the ball vertically upwards. Initially, the ball is stationary. His boot is in contact for 0.05 seconds. The average resultant force on the ball during this time is 180 newtons. The ball leaves his foot at 20 meters per second. Calculate the impulse. So impulse is just change in momentum, and it's calculated by doing force times by time, giving us a impulse of nine newton seconds, or you could also give the unit of kilograms meters per second if you want. So the mass of the ball. So as I just said, impulse is change in momentum. So that means the momentum is changed by 9 newton seconds. So change in momentum would be mass times the change in velocity. So therefore the mass is going to be the change in momentum divided by the change in velocity. So it's going to be 0 0.45 kilograms. Calculate the height to which the ball rises, ignoring air resistance. So if there's no work done, what we can say we can do is we can use conservation of energy and we can say the initial kinetic energy is equal to the final gravitational potential energy because at maximum height, all of its kinetic energy has been transferred into GP. Uh, so we can do half times mass times the initial velocity squared must be equal to the height change. And therefore, we can get what the height change is. It's 20 meters once you plug the values in and have cancelled out the mass. While the boot is in contact, the ball is no longer spherical. State the word used to describe the energy stored in the ball. That's elastic potential energy. OK, so moving on to question three, we've got remote sensing equipment on the surface of a distant planet. The mass is 350. The acceleration is 7.5 meters per second squared. State what is meant by the term weight. Well, it's the force of gravity between two masses. You can't get weight without having two masses and their gravitational fields interact. Calculate the weight of the equipment on the planet. Uh, well, we do weight is mass times gravitational field strength. Uh, so we don't use g equals 10 here. We're using g equals 7.5 because we're on a different planet. The equipment releases a balloon from a point that is a small distance above the surface of the planet. The atmosphere on the surface of this planet has a density of 0.35 kilograms per meter cubed. The inflated balloon has a mass of 80 grams and a volume of 0.3 meters cubed. Make an appropriate calculation and predict and explain the direction of any motion of the balloon. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the density of the balloon itself. So we get 0.27. So what's going to happen is the balloon is going to accelerate upwards. And the reason for that is that the density of the balloon is less than the atmosphere. So that the up thrust force is going to be greater than the object's weight force. That's why it accelerates upwards. 
we might describe that as floating, if you like. A 240 volt 60 watt lamp is connected to a 240 volt supply. The lamp has a constant temperature. State the rate at which lamp transfers energy to the surroundings. Uh, that well, if it's had a potential difference of 240, that means it's going to be 60 watts uh, because that's what the device says. Um, if it was 120 volt supply, we get a power less than 60 watts. The name of the thermal process is by which the lamp transfers energy to the surroundings. Well, everything transfers by radiation, so that's always an option. And we're also going to get conduction transferring the energy from the filament of the lamp itself to the air around it. So the diagram shows a thick copper block that has been heated to 400 degrees Celsius. One side of the block is dull black. The other side of the block is polished and shiny. So... In experiment one, thermometer bulbs are both painted black. They are placed at an equal distance from the surface of the block. The maximum temperature shown by each thermometer is recorded. Explain any difference between the maximum temperature shown by the two thermometers. So a dull black surface is a better emitter of infrared radiation than a shiny one. And so thermometer A's temperature is going to rise faster uh, because it's going to be uh, it's, we, essentially it's going to be emitting more energy per second from the dull black surface. Experiment 2. Thermometer bulbs are both shiny silver coloured. They are placed the same distances uh, for experiment 1. State and explain the differences that are observed in the maximum temperatures shown by the thermometers in the experiments. So the temperature of both thermometers will rise more slowly as shiny silver surfaces are worse absorbers or better reflectors of infrared radiation than dull black is. Okay, so the diagram shows a firefighter wearing a shiny silver coloured clothing. State the benefit of wearing shiny silver coloured clothing. While well, it's there to reduce radiation, so the clothing reflects infrared radiation, preventing the firefighter from getting burned. That's the idea anyway. So the diagram shows some gas trapped in a metal cylinder by a piston. Position of the piston is fixed. The cylinder is moved from a cold room to a warm room. Explain in terms of molecules what is happening to the pressure of the gas in the cylinder. So if you move into a warmer room, the molecules are going to gain, gain energy from the surroundings, and so their speed is going to increase because they've effectively gained kinetic energy. So what that's going to mean is that during every collision, the molecules experience a greater momentum change, and they also collide more frequently with the container, both of which mean we're going to get a larger force on the container and therefore a larger pressure. Okay, so the piston is now released, it moves to the right and finally stops. Explain these observations in terms of the pressure and the volume of the gas in the cylinder. Okay, so initially the pressure inside the container is going to be greater than the pressure outside. And so there's going to be a resultant force to expand the container. Okay. So the container will then expand until the pressures are equal, because what happens is as the volume increases, the pressure inside decreases and you're waiting until you get to the point where the two pressures are equal and the resultant force is now zero. Array of light in glass is instant on a boundary with air. Say what happens to the ray when the angle of instance of the ray is less than the critical angle of the glass. Okay, so if it's less than the critical angle, it's just going to cross the boundary and bend away from the normal because it's going from glass into air. If it's greater than the critical angle, you're going to undergo total internal reflection because you're trying to go from high de optical density to low and you're greater than the critical angle. So the diagram shows a ray of light incident on glass block at A. The critical angle of glass is 41 degrees. Okay. So without calculation, continue the ray. So the angle of incidence here is 60 degrees. That's the angle to the normal. So that's greater than the critical angle. So you're going to get reflection. And at the next boundary, we're going to get it being refracted there. Because uh, it's at, that one's at an angle of incidence of 30 degrees. So it's just going to be refracted. Calculate the refractive index of glass. Uh, so I'm actually going to use the critical angle to do it. So. We know at when the angle of incidence is equal to the critical angle, the angle of refraction is 90 degrees because it goes along the boundary. Uh, we know it's trying to go into air, so we know N2 is 1. So we can then 
essentially get this equation, which we can rearrange to calculate N1, and we get a very typical refractive index for glass. So that makes sense. So a loudspeaker produces a sound wave of constant frequency. State what is meant by frequency? Uh, well, it would be the number of waves per second produced by the loudspeaker. The sound waves travel in air towards a barrier with a small gap at its center. Okay, so the lines represent the compressions of the wave traveling towards the barrier and the distance between them would be a wavelength. State waves meant by a compression, where it's a region of increased density, or because it's a gas we could talk about increased pressure, I suppose, or that the distance between the, the molecules is smaller. Draw the pattern of compressions after the sound waves have passed through the gap. Well, we're going to get these diffraction, so we're going to get these semicircular waves being produced something along these lines because the gap size is similar to the wavelength. So the barrier is adjusted so the gap becomes wider. Describe how this affects the pattern of compressions after the sound wave has passed through the gap. Well, diffraction is going to get less. Uh, so the bigger the gap gets, the smaller the amount of diffraction gets. Um, so we get a smaller, yeah. Frequency of the sound wave is 6,800, the speed is 340. Calculate the wavelength. So we're going to use the wave equation, which is this one. You can rearrange to calculate the wavelength and then plug the numbers in and get what that is. State a typical value for the speed of sound in a liquid. Uh, it's quite a bit faster than the speed of sound of air is. We get something around 1,500 is the speed of sound. A bar magnet is made of metal. So just a metal from which the bar magnet is made. Uh, so it's a magnet, so it needs to be a hard magnetic material. So I'm going to go with steel. So the diagram is a bar magnet being inserted into a coil of wire. The north and the south pole of the magnet are as marked. So we're going north pole in first. And we've connected it to a galvanometer or a very sensitive ammeter. Explain why the galvanometer deflects as the bar magnet is being inserted. So we've got magnetic field lines from the magnet cut through the coil and that exerts a force on the electrons inside the coil so they move and cause an EMF to be induced because essentially all the electrons move to one end of the wire uh, leaving a positively charged end of the other so we've got an EMF. Explain what determines the direction of the reading on the galvanometer. Well EMF is induced to oppose the change that creates it, the change being the movement of the magnet. So it's actually determined by the direction that the magnet is moving and also the pole that is going in first, I suppose. Describe a method for demagnetizing a bar magnet. Uh, so I would slowly remove it from a coil that has alternating current, or you, instead of moving the magnet, you could slowly decrease the size of the current. You could also hammer the magnet or you could heat it. All of those three things would cause your demagnetization. So resistance of a circuit component varies with the brightness of the light falling on its surface. State the name of the component. That is a light dependent resistor. Draw the symbol for that component. Uh, there it is. You can see uh, it's a normal resistor where you're showing photons of light coming in. So the diagram shows a 6 volt battery connected in series with a 1.2 kilo ohm resistor and a thermistor. At a certain temperature, the resistance of the thermistor is 2.4 kilo ohms. Calculate the voltmeter reading. So I'm going to use the potential divider equation to do it. So the potential difference is 6. The resistor we're interested in is the 2400 and we get 4 volts. We could have also calculated the current and then used V equals IR to calculate the potential difference, but that would have given us 4 volts. Uh, the battery connected to the circuit is not changed. Suggest the change that would cause the reading on the voltmeter to decrease. Uh, that would be as if we changed the 1.2 kilo ohm resistor to a larger one, or we could have increased the temperature. That would also have worked as well. So describe the movement of a charge that causes an object to become positively charged, uh, where electrons must be removed from it uh, if it's become positive. So the diagram shows a negatively charged rod held over an uncharged metal sphere. Okay, so, so we've got negative rod. So uh, add signs to represent the movement of charge within the sphere. So what's going to happen is electrons are going to be repelled from the top surface by the electrons in the rod, and that's going to leave the top positive and the bottom negative. 
Prescribed actions must be taken to obtain an even distribution of positive charge on the surface of the sphere, but we must have to remove the electrons from it. So we're going to connect the sphere to Earth while the rod is close so that the electrons don't just move to the other side, the electrons leave the uh, sphere entirely, then you remove the Earth and then remove the rod and that would leave you with a uniformly charged metal sphere. So a radioactive source is tested over a number of hours with a radiation detector. The readings are as shown. Use the readings to suggest a value for background count rate during the test and to determine the half-life of a sample. So you can see towards the end, all of the values are hovering around the 20 counts per second mark. So I'm going to say that's what background is. So the activity of the sample at the initial time is actually 304 and the activity at one hour is actually 76 just from the sample itself. So we can see that that means that over one hour the activity has become a quarter which means two half lives have passed meaning that the one half hour half life is half an hour. If two half lives an hour one half, one half life is half an hour. Okay, so hydrogen-3, also known as tritium, has one proton and two neutrons. The nuclear number of tritium is 3, and it decays by emitting a beta-minus particle. Complete the nucleide equation to show this decay. The symbol X represents the nucleide produced by this decay. So tritium is going to be 3 and 1. This is 3 nucleons and 1 charge of 1. A beta particle has no nucleons and has a charge of minus 1. And that means element X must have three nucleons and must have a charge of two, so the challenge charges balance. Final question. So the arrows show the path of three alpha particles moving towards gold nuclei in a thin foil. Okay, complete the paths of the three particles. So the bottom one we can see is missed the nucleus by quite a long way, so it's going to go pretty much undeflected. The next one has travelled closer to the gold nucleus and it's going to be repelled by it because they're both positively charged. So we're going to get this type of path, whereas the top one has had a near head on collision. So it's going to get bounced back uh, in the direction that it came from. And that completes this uh, exam paper.